Well, good afternoon. My name is Courtney Searwalt. I'm the 4-H Animal Science Extension Specialist here in Indiana, and thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Uh, back um, at the end of March, when um, our lives kind of changed, we decided to do an online animal series, animal science series weekly, and so I believe this is our fourth um, event that we've hosted here virtually on Tuesdays at 3 p.m. So I'd like to start off by just thanking you for coming. Um, a couple of housekeeping rules. Again, if you'll just make sure your video is turned off, that helps us, as well as making sure that your um, video is um, muted. Um, if you are having your own issues with hearing the content, then um, everyone should be able to hear me. Um, Robert, can you give me a thumbs up if you can hear me? All right, so yeah. So if you're having issues, you'll probably wanna log out and then log back in and see if, if it catches up that way. Um, but we do have you muted as a participant. So if you have questions, please drop those down in the chat box and we will answer those as we go along. If we don't get to your question, um, sometimes the questions pile up and we do our best to reach all of the questions, but if for whatever reason we, we miss a question, feel free to reach out to us and we'll be glad to um, get that answered for you. But today I'm excited because we're going to learn about meat goat showmanship as well as some, some um, managing for, for meat goat projects. And we have quite the expert with us here today. Um, Robbie Kelly is the 4-H educator in Elkhart County. Robbie has an extensive background in um, raising boar goats as well as exhibiting them himself and also judging as well as working with youth in our 4-H program. So we're excited to have him here today to share with you some tips and tricks for how to keep working with your 4-H meat goat projects as well as um, other meat goats that you may have at your house and, and your, your breeding operations. So I'm gonna turn it over to Robert and he'll kick, his, kick it off for us today. Thanks, Courtney. Can you hear me good? Yes. Awesome. So I'm excited to be with you. Uh, thanks for the introduction. So I do work in Elkhart County. Um, I'm one of uh, two 4 H educators there. Um, and I have quite, you know, Courtney said, I have a lot of experience raising boar goats. Um, and so I just want to share a little bit of that knowledge with you today. Uh, and as Courtney mentioned, at any time, just pop a, uh, your questions into that chat box. Um, I'll stop periodically throughout the presentation. Uh, just to answer some of those questions. Uh, a lot of today, um, we're just going to go through and have an overview of most of what is going on. Uh, you know, those things that we need to know. So we're going to talk about what is showmanship, uh, have a little bit of training. How do you get started? Um, how do you start training that goat and working with it? Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about nutrition, um, just briefly, uh, some things you should be doing uh, I'm going to encourage you to work with a nutritionist uh, to get the best information, uh, but just give you an overview of what we do uh, here on our farm. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about fitting and show day prep um, because it's always a big question I get. Uh, talk about show day, uh, and then if we have time, I have a short video uh, that North Dakota State Extension did uh, that we're going to kind of talk about how the show arena should be set up and how you should walk around the arena and those kinds of things. So the first thing I always get asked is, you know, what is showmanship? Um, I will tell you that showmanship is probably my favorite class to judge. Uh, and it's as one as an extension educator, I really like to see uh, kids participate in uh, because it really shows off the ability of the youth and what you know about your project. Um, so it's how you work with your animal as a team. Uh, how well have you cared and prepared your animal? Uh, you don't have to have that, you know, $10,000 weather uh, to win a showmanship class. Uh, and so that's what I really like about showmanship and the overall knowledge of your animal. Uh, sometimes judges will ask you questions, um, you know, about your animal, depending upon, you know, are you a first or second year member or are you that senior showman? Uh, just depends on what kind of questions you're going to get asked. So to kind of start training your animal, uh, it's always uh, good to start with your goat early. Uh, so if you raise your goats, uh, just start working with them when they're born. Uh, or uh, once, if you're picking out your goat, um, after you've picked that goat up after a week or two, you should really be starting to work with that animal. 
getting them to get familiar with you. Uh, just being in that pen, uh, just you know, hanging out with them a little bit, getting them friendly. Uh, just a few pieces of advice is you know, be patient as it takes a lot of practice. Um, they're not gonna come right up to you the first time uh, and you've gotta start to build that trust with that animal. Uh, one of the things I always like to say, uh, especially for newer people, uh, when you're working with your goats, uh, I always find it easier if you work them in pairs. So say for example, you're out walking your goat and you're training them. Um, typically it's better to do that in pairs. So if you have a brother or sister, um, or if you share a barn with a cousin, um, you know, it's always good to have them uh, work with you uh, on goats. Um, and it, one of the big keys that I always preach to everyone is that every interaction that you have with your animals should be positive. Um, because that animal is going to remember um, a lot of things. And so you want every interaction you have with them to be positive. Um, so we know sometimes it can be frustrating and animals don't always do what we want, uh, but it's really great uh, to just take that time and, and make them interacting with them be positive. You know, so when should you start? You know, again, um, Shortly after you, uh, you purchase that animal and you get it to your house, uh, especially if a marketing animal, um, you know, you should start working with them just a couple days after they get to your, uh, your new place. Um, I know uh, when, we, when we have goats here, uh, we actually work with them all the time, not necessarily training, but them getting used to you. Uh, one of the things that you should do uh, is we know that uh, breaking a goat to lead is what we like to call it, um, can take a little bit of time. Uh, so you wanna train them to lead at first. Uh, and I use a couple of different methods for that. Uh, you can either use a, a cloth collar uh, or you can use a rope halter uh, to really start to train and have that animal have some interaction. Uh, sometimes people will also tie their animal to the fence to hold its head up and get used to being handled. Uh, that's a way you can start as well. Uh, there's no right or wrong difference in between that. Um, but making sure if you do have your animal tied up or you put it on the stand, uh, sometimes, you know, people will just put them on the grooming stand just to get them used to getting set up. Um, make sure not to leave that, leave that animal alone. That's really important to remember as well. Uh, once you've done that, then uh, we start using uh, our show halter, our show collars with the animals uh, to get them used to that kind of um, method of moving them around. Uh, once you've done that, some shows, and I'll talk more about bracing here in just a little while, um, that um, is then you'll start working on that. So people often ask, um, what type of uh, collars should you use for goats? Uh, there's lots of those out there. Um, and, and a lot of it comes down to personal preference. Um, for me, uh, you'll see the two that are on your left hand screen, uh, the pinch type collar, uh, those are the ones I prefer the best. Um, I just think it gives us a little more control over the animal um, and gives us a little more flexibility with that animal uh, and it's um, really good for me to use. Uh, you'll notice there on the, the second one, that's another good one where the prongs are only on the bottom. Uh, the third one there, uh, that one works fairly well as, um, as a halter too. Uh, a lot of people commonly refer them to as, as Hummel halters. Uh, those work as work well as well. Uh, and then we have our fourth one over there on the right hand side, uh, just the plain uh, leather choker collar. Uh, those are okay. Uh, that I would use for more experienced showmen. Uh, so if you're just a first or second year member starting out, I really prefer those uh, two over there on the left hand side, uh, the right hand side one uh, on the very end. Um, I would only use as experienced showman. Uh, and the reason I say that, that first one, I think just gives you a little more control over that animal um, and gives you some more flexibility uh, and gets that animal to respond to you just a little bit quicker. And, and I realize that sometimes people may think um, that those don't look as pretty uh, or look a little more, uh, not as friendly as the one all the way on the right hand side. Um, and so I encourage you just to do a test on your hand because we know sometimes goats, want to act like they're choking when you're moving them around the arena. Um, I can assure you uh, they're probably using the collar on the right hand side versus the one on the left. Um, and so, and it's because of that windpipe on that animal. Um, the one on our right hand side, the pinch or the left hand side, that pinch collar allows us to have pressure points um, and doesn't cut off the windpipe like the one on the uh, right hand side does. 
So again, once you've gotten that animal, uh, you started working with them a little bit, then it's time to really use that show collar. The big thing with those is you need to make sure it fits properly for that animal. Um, so the big thing, you know, sometimes they will sell more links for those. Uh, there's, they sell them in different lengths as well. Um, you can get them at any major um, show supplier, uh, those collars. Make sure it fits properly. Uh, I know in our barn, you can walk in and there's probably 15 different ones. Uh, just because the, you know we have everything from young stock to um, seven and eight year old breeding does. So we have to have different sizes for our goats. Uh, and that making sure that uh, you, know, you have firm control of your animal and you're working with them, um, that, those are big keys. Uh, and those uh, properly fitted show collars will allow you to do that. And, and so that's something to, to be thinking about. Um, Robert, we do have a question um, about where, where would you recommend or where should a 4-H member look to purchase these collars? So that's a great question. Um, so think, uh, places like Tractor Supply uh, and uh, Stock and Field typically carry those. Sometimes they don't and they can order them for you. Um, some of our major supply stores um, or catalog outlets like Sullivan's Weavers uh, are good places as well. They do have those products. Um, and sometimes if you have a local, you know, local feed store, they can order them for you as well. Any other questions on collars or training so far? Nope, I don't okay. see any others. Um, I think you'll probably get to this, but tips and tricks for halter breaking stubborn goats. So I didn't put that in here, uh, but that's a great question. Um, sometimes animals just don't want to cooperate and we know that. Um, so some tips that I've done is putting them on a, on a rope halter um, and I will actually tie them to the fence um, to where they can't move a whole lot uh, and they have to stay in there. That gives them a little bit of, um, you know, okay, I have to get used to this kind of training. Um, sometimes I'll put them on a show stand um, and just let them stand there. Uh, obviously, you want to have supervision over that animal the entire time that you're doing that. Um, so be sure to be aware of that. Courtney, my presentation disappeared. There we go. It's back. I don't know what happened there. Okay. Okay. All right. I think um, these colors are recommended and in this in this point of reference to boar goats, yes. Yes, so these are what I would recommend for boar goats. Now, if you're showing a dairy animal, um, you would wanna use the one on the very right-hand side, and they do also make other uh, choker collars that are similar to dogs that are a little bit thinner for the animal. Uh, and that's something to note too. So if you're showing a, a market animal, um, the thinner ones work really well. Uh, you don't want to buy the big, huge, bulky ones uh, for a market animal just because it distracts from, you know, the true size of the neck and, and chest on that animal. Um, but if you are showing a, a bigger breeding doe, uh, then you would probably want to buy a little bit bigger chain. Uh, the ones that we have for some of our larger does uh, are a little bit thicker uh, made. Uh, so depending on that size of goat um, also depends on, on the width of the chain you would buy. Uh, is it normal? I have a few more questions. Is it normal for a goat to snort when you put on their collar? Uh, sometimes that does happen. Um, and it's just um, depending uh, on the goat, they do get a little temperamental and that's just one way they show that. Okay. Why are leather collars better for more experienced owners? So leather collars. Um, so the reference I don't have a preference if it's a leather or if it's a, a plastic type collar. Um, the one on the far right hand side, um, the one without the um, prongs on it, I just like that a little better because typically showmen um, have a little more control and they're not as jerky with the goats. 
um, and they can be a little more, they can handle the animals just a little bit more firmly than a child that's younger that probably doesn't weigh near as much. Okay. And do judges have a preference in what leads a showman uses? You know, that's a great question and it's gonna depend upon judge to judge. Um, so I would say most of the judges that I've had conversations with um, and myself, my preference uh, is those first two. Um, some people don't like the third one. Um, I just think moving around the animal, those first two work a little bit better than the third one. Okay. All right, I think um, we'll, we'll proceed. Some great questions so far, keep them coming. So the next part is bracing. Um, so my big thing with that is it only should be done with market animals. Um, people tend to show these like they're lambs, they are not lambs. Um, and so we should be showing them truly like a goat. Um, and so again, keyword only should be done with market animals. Um, you should not be bracing your breeding stock unless it's a what we call weather dams. Um, so, which is kind of like, a, it's a female intended for uh, market purposes or next generation breeding that's different uh, than our traditional uh, breeding stock. Sometimes, just, to, just a disclaimer here, uh, making sure you know your show rules. Uh, I know there are some counties out there, um, depending on where you go or even open shows, um, that don't want you to brace. Uh, sometimes they allow you to brace, uh, but without lifting the feet on the ground. Um, and, and so that's also another thing that I always like to tell people your feet should be back on the ground when you're bracing that animal. It's fine to pick them up uh, to get them into that brace, but making sure that those feet go back on that ground and they're braced when you have those feet. Uh, so kind of why do we brace our animals? Uh, I think the big thing for me um, is it really gives uh, more definition to that top line and leg muscle of the animal, um, and it gives them that firmer feel that the judge is really looking for when we evaluate them. Um, and another key point to this, it should only be done while the judge is touching the animal. Uh, and you'll see some photos later that I have in here. Um, and the reason I say it should only be done when the judge is touching the animal um, is because you need to make sure that the judge has a view of all those, all sides your animal at all times. Um, if, you know, so say for example, you're in a head to tail line um, and the judge is at the very front of the line and you're seeing um, and you're blocking the front view of that animal, that chest and the width through there, you're putting yourself at a disadvantage and you don't want to do that. Um, so that's something to watch out for. Um, and then again, just while the animals, while the judge is feeling the animal, because sometimes um, goats don't look that great when they're braced from the side profile. Uh, and you want to have every opportunity uh, to give the judge the best view of that animal. Uh, so as you'll see on our screen here, how to, you know, how do I start bracing? How do I teach my goat to brace? Uh, I think this is something that sometimes goats pick up naturally, or they are very hard and just don't understand the concept of bracing. And um, I know I've worked with plenty of members uh, to understand how to brace animals. Um, and so I typically start after they're broke to lead. Um, because again, you got to get them comfortable with you uh, and to build that trust and relationship with your animal. Uh, I'm sure many of you that are experienced know that. Um, so you'll see here in our pictures, uh, that first one, um, you'll see how the leg is set up and I kind of kind of call it the L shape. Uh, you're gonna stand in front of that animal and you're really putting that knee kind of there into the chest of the animal. And that animal should start to push back against your leg. Uh, that's when you know the animal's bracing. Um, and, and what I tell 4-Hers is you wanna challenge yourself to do that. Uh, and it's gonna take a little bit of practice and a little bit of time. Um, to learn to do that. And so if you look uh, there in the one picture, uh, the figure 12, uh, that's what that animal looks like from the side profile. Um, that animal looks pretty decent. Uh, for me though, when it's braced from the side and that judge is looking at it, if you look at that back one third of that animal, that animal on the brace profile uh, kind of looks like she breaks a little bit between the hip and the loin there. Uh, so that kind of hints when I said earlier, uh, you need to be making sure um, when you're have your animal presented, you want to present it the best you can. Um, if if that person wasn't bracing that animal, it may not appear that that uh, animal kind of breaks in its top line a little bit. Um, so that's something judges look out for. Um, some tips to start bracing: uh, a few things that I do. 
um, you know, kind of get yourself set, that 4 h -er set up in that stance and see if you can get that animal to start pushing against your leg. Sometimes um, what I've done when we've taught animals to brace is I'll actually walk them backwards so that they start to push into my leg um, to start to get them to do that. And sometimes you do have to gently pick them up just a slight uh, inch or two off the ground to get them to push uh, and then set them down. And they'll continue to be in that brace. Hey Robert, um, we have yeah. a couple questions about kind of explaining exactly what bracing is and the purpose. Right. So bracing uh, really gets uh, what it does is it gets that animal to push against the showman. Um, so I realize, and it's a challenge for our 4 uh who are younger or in our smaller, uh, smaller body type uh, to get them to brace a, you know, a 75, 80 pound market goat when it weighs the same as our 4 -er. um, And so what it does, if you look at how the 4 -er is standing there in the picture, um, is it pushes against the animal. And what it does is it actually um, kind of firms up the animal's body type. Uh, so uh, as you start to practice this, and I've worked with uh, plenty of people, um, you can feel a goat that feels pretty good along the top line. Um, but if you get that animal to brace, it actually tightens up those muscles just slightly uh, and gives you a firmer feel. Um, and it's, our, it's just expressing what's already there um, in the animal. Okay, another question someone asked about... Um, Bracing, again, when you're bracing, you're traditionally bracing your weathers or your weather dams. So those, um, those animals that are primarily more intended for, for meat purposes, or as Robert put, um, you know, first generation breeding, I'll let you use your words in that. Um, but then we had a question about, yes, there definitely is a difference in how you show a dairy goat versus a uh, meat goat. And so today we're talking primarily about meat goats. Um, potentially we, we will have a session on dairy goats, but at this time we're focused on the meat goats. Yeah, and that's a great point. So, so on the meat goat or on the dairy goat side, we're not going to be doing bracing. Um, but some of the ways we do set up uh, market dairy goats uh, is the same on, on the boar market goats too. And then let's see. Um, you do not brace pygmy goats. That was a question. Um, Um, when, when, when you brace in the ring, do you use a collar was one question. And then also in the same token, um, where did that go? Do you show them without a lead? Okay. So great questions. Um, you should always show a goat with a lead. Um, so whether it's a market goat uh, or a breeding goat, uh, you always show with a show collar. Um, is what was the first question? Sorry, Courtney. The first question was, do you, was about, do you show them with the lead? Okay. We answered that. And then when, when you're bracing them in the ring, yes, you would use a, you still have that collar on them. Yeah. Yes. So when you, so when you're bracing them, um, you always have that, I always have that collar up on the animal. Um, I'm not physically holding onto that collar, but it's still up around the base of their neck where it should be. Uh, but they realize that they're still showing and they have that. And we had questions about bracing uh, mitonic or fainting goats and no, you would not brace those goats either. Um, when you start to train your goat, is it normal for them to jump and lay down? <laughs> yes, uh, goats do love to jump and lay down and, and be lazy or be super excited. Um, so you just kind of kind of break them with that habit. Uh, if you have a goat that really likes to jump, uh, I really suggest starting to use a, a lamb halter um, that goes fully around the face uh, to break them. And you should really start to pull that animal back down if it starts to jump um, to show, show them who's in control. And then about collars, what if you just use a leash around the goat's neck? Um, you should, so if you're walking them at home, that is okay, but in the show arena, 
uh, you should really use those collars that we indicated before. Uh, cloth collar is not appropriate. Okay. Should you brace a dairy slash meat market weather? It's a great question. Um, typically, you do not brace the, the dairy weathers for a uh, show, but if it is a meat market animal uh, that's of the boar type breed, then you should brace it. Okay, I think. Kiko should be shown as boars, right? They are considered a meat type breed, yes. Okay. And then last question for now, um, how do you break a goat to stop falling on the ground when you walk them? It's a great question. Um, lots of patience. Um, if that goat continues to lay down, um, sometimes it takes a little bit of encouragement by um, continuing to get that goat up. You can use the tail of the animal. Uh, obviously, you don't want to pull very hard on that tail, um, but that's one way you can get them up to keep them, keep them moving. Okay. And then um, the same would be if they're dragging, you're just, just practice makes perfect. Um, yeah. And again, if, if there's a question that we may have missed or one that doesn't necessarily pertain to this particular topic uh, in terms of um, what we're focusing on today, we're trying to relate the content. But if you have a, another goat related question, I'm sure that um, Robert would be more than willing to, uh, to look at that. There's been some questions about individual shows and their policies. And again, it's going to depend on the show. So please take the time, whether it be the state fair or your county fair, to investigate what their um, policies are for, for different leads, um, as well as just making sure uh, the, the concept of knowing before you show. So um, as, a, as a, an exhibitor, that's your responsibility in terms of knowing uh, different policies and procedures. So make sure that you take some time to look at that um, when you are signing up for, for whatever show it may be. The question. So um, next I'm going to jump into uh, of just a brief overview about nutrition um, because I know some people get at, will ask, uh, you know, what do we feed our animals? Uh, what should we do? Um, so market animals are completely fed different than what our breeding stock are going to be. Uh, and this is just a typical average for our market goats. They'll gain anywhere from 0.3 to 0.5 pounds uh, a day. Um, so if you're a person who's actually weighing your animals a couple times a week, uh, trying to project um, what weight range you want your animals to be in, um, you know, that's kind of the rough figure I use is 0.3 to 0.5 pounds a day um, when, when we're trying to figure out where do we want those animals to be. So um, if you're a person who actually uh, buys your animals, um, you know, typically in the late March, early May, or sorry, late March, early April time frame or mid-April, um, you can work with your breeders who get your animals from uh, on how much you should feed. Uh, typically what we tell people from us, uh, they should already be eating roughly one and a half to two pounds of feed uh, shortly after weaning a day uh, to help them on that growth curve. Now, as the animal gets older, um, you're going to want to increase uh, that feed intake on that animal, uh, depending on, you know, what rate, what range of weight you want to be at. Um, one of the things that I've, and it's all over the board uh, as far as market weathers and weather dams, um, we need to be feeding some hay to them. Uh, they are ruminant animals, so they need a little bit of that roughage uh, for their rumen and that, uh, and their development. Um, but you also want to limit the amount of hay that they get. Uh, you don't need to be giving them three or four flakes of hay a day um, because that is way too much. And I've seen a lot of weathers uh, when you're in the show arena, uh, they just have big bellies on them. And it's because they've probably had too much hay. Um, so what our typical rule of thumb for those are uh, is anywhere between a baseball and a softball size um, fist uh, for hay a day uh, is plenty appropriate for um, a market animal uh, that's going to be uh, used in show. Uh, typically, uh, when you're selecting feeds, uh, I think pelleted feeds work the best for market animals. Um, I just think it because of the complete nutrition they get in one pellet versus a textured feed, uh, they're not sorting feed, and so it gets them a little, you know, they're eating one thing. 
Uh, typically on a market animal, we're feeding anywhere from 16 to 18% protein, uh, depending on if it's animal that we're starting out feeding that's just weaned. Uh, is it an animal that's still growing or is it towards uh, market ready and we need to back down that protein as well? Um, one of the other things you should always do uh, is have clean, fresh water for your animal. Uh, that's really important to know about. Uh, just a few other things that aren't on my slide here uh, that I want you to be aware of. Uh, I typically, starting out with the market goats, if I really want them to gain weight, um, I'll be feeding them twice a day. Now, if it's an animal that you know is at that 80, 85 pound mark, depending on that body size of that animal, uh, and we're getting pretty close, um, one of the things that you want to do um, as I spread that feeding out over a couple of times that during that day, I'll add, you could be three times, you could be four times a day that animal gets fed. And what that does is it limits that intake a little bit and it slows them down on their growth curve. Uh, just for, uh, just kind of set up what I use uh, is uh, for market animals. Um, one of the things that you can do uh, that's really inexpensive um, to help them build a little bit of muscle as you're starting to feed them uh, is we actually feed it on incline. Um, so this isn't uh, from our farm here, uh, but you'll see there on the picture, there's a little bit of an incline where that goat actually has to go up a ramp. Um, and then there's a feed trough right there that the animal can stand on. And so what that does is it helps them climb and it makes them stand on those back leg muscles and it'll actually help firm up uh, that animal to give them a little more definition in their leg. Uh, so that's just a, something that we do um, to give them uh, just a little bit higher profile. Robert, a couple questions. Um, yeah. Just to clarify, when you said after weaning they should be fed 1.5 to 2 pounds, does that mean per day or, or each time? Uh, so that's starting out, that's a minimum per day. Uh, some people will feed them three or more. Um, we start them out just a little slower uh, and see where they're at on that intake. Um, and, you know, it depends upon, you got to kind of project out to, um, you know, how big do you want that animal to be? Um, so at a minimum, they should be eating 1.5 to 2 pounds per day. Um, so divide that up. So if you're feeding 2 pounds a day, a pound in the morning and a pound in the evening. Um, I just find it better to feed them twice a day versus one. Okay. Those are the nutrition related questions for the time being. Okay. Awesome. So breeding stock is a little bit different. Uh, and that's going to depend upon um, do you have a young doe uh, that, you know, is it's this year's doe uh, or are you showing a yearling or are you showing a, an older doe? Um, you could feed them a pelleted or textured feed. Um, I tend to actually, our breeding stock at home, I tend to mix that um, with our, we actually have a pelleted feed that we use uh, and then I tend to mix it with a textured feed as well. Um, typically uh, this time of year as I'm not wanting those does to gain, all, I'm putting some weight back on them. Um, for us, the texture feeds a little lower in protein. Uh, so that's just their maintenance ration. Uh, we're drying up all of our does, so I'm giving them some more, more grain there, some more nutrition. Uh, so that really depends upon the stage of production uh, that you're in with your animal. Um, you definitely uh, feed them more hay than you would that market animal. Um, you know, sometimes people will give them unlimited amount of hay, which is uh, okay. Uh, again, just looking at the size of the animal uh, and evaluating, you know, do they need more grain in their diet? Do they not? Um, typically for a mature doe that's not, you know, that's just gaining weight back, um, we typically feed a 16% protein ration uh, to, uh, and they're getting fed probably um, two pounds to three pounds a day right now, just because we're trying to put some weight back on them uh, from, you know, getting over kidding and drying up. Um, you know, if they're starting to kid, we start to, um, while they're in production, they're getting that much as they're getting a little more grain than that. Um, and then 18% is typically we bump our growing does up to. So our yearlings and our, um, our does from this year, uh, that's what they're getting fed. Um, and they're getting fed, uh, about two, uh, right now at this stage, they're getting fed between two and three pounds a day as well, uh, to really gain some muscle and body weight on them. All right, a few questions. Um, so I'm going to kind of uh, generically ask these so we don't get into specifics of, of product brands and so forth. But uh, how, do you, how do you determine what kind of feed is best for your, your goat project? 
So it, it depends upon, um, you know, I have, there's, there are lots of feed companies out there uh, and they all have really, really good products. Um, and so there are a couple that I use, um, but like Courtney indicated, not to get in trouble. Uh, um, I'm not going to say which one we use, um, but I evaluate. So I look at the feed label um, and I'm looking at the overall condition of the animal. So do I need more fat in my, uh, in my feed. Uh, so you'll see some feeds uh, on a market animal, you're not going to have as much fat uh, content uh, that you would feed your market animal as you would your breeding stock. Um, protein, uh, typically anywhere from 16 to 18% is the average. Um, again, if it's an animal you want to gain a little more weight, uh, trying to you know get them to be a little leaner, you want some more protein. Um, and some other things I always encourage people to look at too, uh, and this goes for whether it's a breeding stock animal or a market weather, uh, your calcium and phosphorus ratio uh, should uh, make sure to look at that as well uh, for urinary tract infections uh, that can happen in market animals. You want that to be a two to one ratio. Uh, so be sure to look at that. Um, the other question we had someone ask specifically about where their goat is in terms of weight. So I'm going to rephrase it so it, it answers more of the, the group's potential question. Um, how do you know if your goat is on weight target for a show? Maybe you don't have access to scales. What are some good ways to measure um, where that end goal should be for your for that particular goat? So that's a great question, Courtney. Um, so what I always uh, tell people, um, and I've gotten a pretty good eye for kind of judging where they're weight wise. Um, sometimes people have a bathroom scale at home too. Uh, if you have somebody strong enough to hold that goat weigh yourself and then hold the goat and get back on the scale. Um, that's kind of the, the cheap way to do it. Uh, and that's a okay. Um, but what you should probably do, uh, is we're looking for overall body confirmation. Uh, goats get fat from the inside out. Okay. Uh, they're different than a lot of our market animals. Again, they get fat from the inside out. So if you really start to feel fat on your animal, um, that's an indication that we're almost done. Uh, with that. So what I always tell people is if you take your hand um, and you kind of pinch right there in between your thumb and your first finger, uh, that's about how much fat you should feel on the, uh, the ribs of your animal. Okay. Um, you don't want really any more coverage than that on your animal uh, because uh, what it does um, is it over finishes that animal and, and really means it's past market ready. Um, and we really, and I know as a lot of people, we try to get those animals as close to being market ready for those shows. Um, so it takes a little bit of experience to do that uh, and just kind of looking. Um, and again, using that average of that animal is going to gain uh, almost a half a pound a day. I've seen animals go beyond that, um, but that's the typical average. So um, my weight range uh, for a competitive market goat uh, it really just depends upon the build of the specific animal. Uh, most of the time it can be anywhere from uh, 70 to 80 pounds. And okay. it can be a little higher as well. Okay. So your, your target weight is, is between that, market weight would be between that 70 and 80 pounds time frame. Yeah, and, and I've seen some that, um, you know, if it's a bigger framed animal, uh, just like in cattle, it may, you know, take to 90 pounds to really get that animal to finish. Yeah. And, and just, it's so interesting because that whole concept, um, I, I had meat goats my very first, the, one of the very first years that they were a project here in Indiana 4-H and um, the weight range has definitely changed um, from, from when I first started in, in that project as well. Um, a couple other questions about feeding companions. Is it acceptable to feed weathers and does together or how do you ensure that this particular goat's getting the right feed? <laughs> so that's a great question. Um, most of the time when I was raising market, uh, when we would have show weathers, um, obviously I just, you know, I don't raise them out to finish anymore. Um, I, I just raise breeding stock, but we do sell some weathers. And so obviously I have some experience getting them ready to where they need to be uh, to sell at a young age. Um, but what uh, I tell a lot of 4-Hers is if um, it's okay to have two or three in a pen, um, but have separate feeders in that pen. And sometimes uh, what I've seen people do uh, is they will actually just have a lead there um, and they'll kind of 
put that goat and tie it up next to their feed dish so that they can't go run and get the other goats food. Uh, and I realize that takes a little bit of time because um, you want to have a couple goats in the pen together because they get lonely and they're a herd animal. Um, and make sure the animals are relatively the same size. So you don't want to put a mature doe or a yearling doe in with this year's kid just because they're obviously that older doe is going to get more feed. So I would, unless you, you know, have a way you can separate them to feed them, um, you know, just keep an eye on that. Okay. And then we'll take one more question for this particular topic. Um, is it, uh, where did it go? Would you have any suggestions or recommendations for supplements or things to think about if you're thinking about a supplement or in general, why would I look towards a supplement? So that's, that's another great question. Um, you know, sometimes there, everyone has, I, I want to call it their, uh, their circus magic um, <laughs> to sum it all up. Um, there are lots of great supplements out there. Uh, I've used some of them on our animals. Um, and what that does is it helps just give a little bit of extra, um, extra coverage. It could make it have a little more muscle definition. Uh, and again, making sure you're checking with your show rules. Uh, because most supplements are, are approved and totally fine. There are some out there that you should not be using. Um, just making sure to read that feed label, uh, just as you would a regular one. Um, there are some out there uh, that are drenches. There's some out there that you would mix into the feed. Um, sometimes there's uh, fat supplements. So uh, if you're getting, you know, three weeks out from fair and that animal is really not starting to have some fat coverage, uh, you could add a, you know, a fat product into that uh, feed to boost the fat uh, content so that they'll start finishing. Um, so that's one way to kind of look at it. And it's that again, is kind of a trial and error uh, depending upon the specific animal because every animal finishes a little bit differently uh, and has just a tick more differences in their uh, nutrition. <laughs> okay. I think that's all the questions. <laughs> Excuse me for now. Okay. Awesome. So let's move to fitting. Um, so this is another thing uh, that people ask a lot about. Um, one of the things uh, that I always tell people, uh, market animals are trimmed completely different than breeding stock. Um, you should never ever shear, slick shear a breeding stock animal. Um, one of the tips, uh, the big thing uh, that you should first do, um, and you should not wait till two weeks before the county fair or whatever fair you're going to, uh, to clip your animal for the first time. Um, you should probably do that a couple of times just to get that animal used to it. Uh, it's a different noise. It's just kind of a different habit uh, for that animal. Um, so the first thing you should do before you clip your animal is you should wash and blow dry that animal completely and thoroughly. Um, there are lots of different products out there to use. Uh, typically the first time we wash our animals for the show season, um, I will use um, a dishwashing liquid like Dawn uh, because it helps cut the grease out of some of their hair. Um, and then I'll use a, a shampoo product, uh, to, particularly on white goats. Uh, there's lots of products out there that uh, are made for specifically white animals to help them uh, keep that white natural look um, that will use that. Uh, typically, it's a purple shampoo. Uh, and make sure it's completely dry, and then I'll actually clip that animal. Uh, market goats, uh, really five to seven days out before your show, you should clip that animal. Um, breeding stock can be done two to, day, two to four days before. Uh, you should only be doing touch-ups that day of the show or that night before the show. Uh, and I also trim the feet uh, about a week out on those animals um, because if you've had the wonderful experience of trimming goat hooves, uh, once in a great while you nick a foot. Um, and so uh, it gives them time to repair uh, and so they're not limping in the show arena. Um, Robert, there was a yeah. question earlier on, and I fit, I thought you were going to get to it, but how do you trim a goat's foot feet? So that's a great question. Um, and I actually don't have that in my presentation exactly how to trim their foot. Um, but if you get Courtney, your email address, um, we can send you a short clip on how to do that. Um, okay. And then are there different clipper links recommended for different breeds of meat goats? So I'm going to go just... I think clipping. Yes. So I'm going to go between um, market goats and then we're going to get into the breeding stock on the different kinds of clippers we use. Um, so 
I'll touch, hopefully I touch base on that. And if I don't, just pop in a more specific question. So um, meat, market goats are typically slick sheared. Um, so there are lots of different places out there. Um, you know, a number 10 blade, um, I actually like to use a little bit bigger one um, because you want to leave just a little bit of hair. And this, this goat in particular that's here, uh, this was the same knife this animal was clipped. Um, so you'll notice a few lines in that animal, and that's why I say go five to seven days out, uh, because that hair will start to grow back in, in case you make a, a nick in that animal, um, because we know that happens with clippers. It has time to grow back. Um, with market animals, you want to clip um, their entire body. So you'll notice on this goat, um, we left the hair from the, leg, from the knees down. And on the back of that animal, you'll notice that we left the hair from the hawks down on that, on that market uh, weather. Uh, so that's the big thing with the market weather is you're going to completely shave the body, um, do a lot of touch up on the head um, and making sure, uh, you know, you got all the hair off of there that needs to be uh, and the ears as well. And that tail switch, um, just kind of cleaning that up. Um, some people will make a poof ball at the end of the animal. Um, it, doesn't need to look like a paintbrush, okay? So you wanna clip that back hair um, and, and kind of really uniform that hair on that tail. Um, this was a rough clip job. Um, it's not 100% perfect. And you're also gonna shave underneath the belly there um, of that animal. Um, there are different uh, clippers out there. Lister makes a product. Um, you got some Oster clippers. Uh, the bigger sets typically what I use for that um, to do these animals. I don't particularly care to use the smaller clippers on them. I know a lot of people will. Uh, it's just personal preference when it comes to shearing that specific market goat. So next uh, is going to be our breeding stock. Um, so here's one of a, a one of a Bordeaux. Um, now this is the most what I'm familiar with. Uh, not as familiar with our Kiko uh, in Spanish breeds, um, but I know they clip fairly, fairly similar. Um, so in the breeding stock here, uh, we definitely don't slick shear our animals. Um, so there's lots of different recommendations uh, to go uh, with these. Um, but you'll look here and notice in this doe, um, she's got still some plenty of hair to her. Uh, the big thing with clipping them, um, and I could spend hours telling you about clipping, um, but I'm just, again, doing a brief overview of them. Uh, what I'm going to do with her, uh, you'll notice I've really, uh, I've trimmed out the, the hair on her chest and neck. And what that does is it allows you uh, to really show off that part of the animal. Um, now, if she had really, really long hair, most of our does, uh, I'll take and I'll put a, on a smaller set of clippers, I will take a um, inch long guide and totally body clip them if their hair is super long. Most of the time on our does, it's not. Uh, so it's no more than an inch in length. Uh, on that chest, I'm using um, depending on the doe uh, and just knowing that animal uh, is really important. Uh, I'll go a half inch or smaller on her chest uh, just to shave that hair. Uh, and then I'll also blend that in through her neck and through her shoulders uh, just to give her a little more definition. Kind of clean that underline some, uh, making sure she continues uh, to have that nice feminine wedge as we call it, uh, making sure as, as she continues to go back uh, she's as wide in the front as she is in the rear, uh, just doing some clipping on there and just blending it in on them. Robert, can you define what slick, she slick shearing is? Uh, so slick shearing for me, um, it's taking essentially almost all the hair off and just leaving very little. Uh, so if you're using like a number 10 blade or if you have a set of Osters or um, another brand, uh, just using, um, I figure what the blade number is, um, but it's the, one of the smaller end blades, so they don't have very long hair. Okay, and then should you leave a, an adult's thumb of hair? I think what they're asking is the, the end of the tail, how much hair should you leave in, in that scenario? Uh, so on, on a breeding stock animal, just the same as you do the weathers, actually probably a little more because you're not slick shearing it. I'm just taking the back side of that tail, and I'm going to run that clipper blade up just to make sure it's all uniform. Um, and what I do is I find the very end of the tailbone uh, as I'm clipping and I kind of put my fingers there uh, and I just kind of take the blade over the top of it um, so that it kind of looks like it's supposed to end and it looks natural. 
Okay. Um, what's the best way to bone the legs on? I, I think that was actually a market question. Yeah, so there are, um, I will tell you, I am not the best at doing that. Um, so full disclaimer, um, because I'm breeding stock, we typically don't do that and that's what I show. Um, but uh, there are, uh, people have uh, brushes out there, you can use combs um, that you'll use a, like a light or a medium adhesive uh, that they'll blow on the legs and comb up. Uh, sometimes they use, um, the, it's a, like a, called a roto fluffer, uh, just a little attachment ink on the end of the drill to turn it to get those like hairs to fluff up as well. Um, practice makes perfect on that. Uh, so please be sure um, to bring them to the arena that they look somewhat natural when you've boned those legs up and it takes time to train that hair. Um, don't come at, don't cut, don't look, don't come in the arena looking like a hot mess uh, because then the judge is really going to know that you did that. Um, so you want it to look somewhat natural when you do those things. Okay. And then one other good, I think pretty good question here. What temperature of water do you wash your goat at? Um, so that's a great question. Um, as we know, um, I, in our barn, I don't have heated water. Um, so today, like this, if you're in northern Indiana, you know it's, it's pretty decent out, actually. Um, if I mix in a bucket of water and I have, am I able to go outside? Um, you don't want it to be too hot. Um, typically, I just use faucet water with a garden hose. Sometimes they get a little chilly, so obviously you don't want to be washing them in the middle of January unless you're in a heated facility. Yeah, if they're shivering or um, showing a reaction to the water in, in a pretty dramatic way, then you know that you probably need to reconfigure how you're washing that animal regardless of the, the species, just like you, you would your, when you're thinking about the time that it's time to go swimming or maybe I need to not go swimming because it's too cold today. <laughs> Yep, absolutely. So I'm going to go into just a few more things because um, I want to be respectful of your all's time. And these are still great questions, so keep them coming. Uh, so the question I get asked, uh, what should I wear show day? Uh, it's a great question. Um, boots or leather shoes are preferable uh, that you should wear in the show arena. Please don't wear tennis shoes or I know I've seen a lot of people wearing those, um, you know, things that are not leather shoes. Uh, or boots, it looks a lot more dressy uh, to do that. Uh, and it's just for the safety of the exhibitor. I mean, even though we think of goats not weighing that much as the, what a steer would, uh, they can still step on your feet and could possibly break a toe. So you just want to be aware of that. Uh, those leather shoes like boots are just a little more durable for that. Nice jeans that don't have holes. Uh, they don't have to be super fancy. Um, you know, just something that's nice and clean. Uh, a button-up shirt uh, with a collar is preferable. It could be a polo. Uh, depending on what time of year it is. Um, you know, it could be super hot and 90 degrees. I totally understand you if you want to wear a short sleeve shirt. Totally fine. Um, I know some counties will have club shirts that they wear for showmanship. That's totally fine as well. Um, you should also wear a belt. Um, it's just uh, something to be aware of. Um, you know, and don't over bling yourself, as I like to say, um, because it does get very distracting. Um, but, you know, just making sure you look nice and presentable, um, you know, nothing super fancy. Just a few more tips for show day. Uh, and, and even when you're practicing working with your animal, uh, I, you always want to keep your goat between you and the judge. Uh, you should never, ever obstruct the view of the judge for your animal. Uh, so it's really important uh, to keep the eye on the judge and know where they're at so you know what side of the animal to be on. Um, because you want that to be your advantage. Uh, one of the other things I always tell people is you always cross in front of the animal, never behind the animal. And the reason for that is that way you don't spook the animal uh, and they know where you're going and you can see them. Uh, one of the other things too is uh, someone kind of asked this question earlier is that, you know, if your goat really doesn't like to lead, uh, don't be the first one in the arena. Um, you know, have someone go in front of you. Sometimes goats like to be followers versus leaders. Uh, so being aware of that, uh, making sure you're giving yourself plenty of room to move around the arena. Um, no, don't get bunched up because, again, you want that judge to have a good advantage point to see you. Um, and your animal should always be set up square. And I've got some more pictures in my next slide here uh, that I want to show you. 
Uh, so as you'll see- A couple things, I'm gonna- Go ahead, Courtney, oh, sorry. sorry. I'm gonna answer real quick. Um, could you wear leggings? Jeans are jeans are very much the preferred method of leg attire. Um, you should, and someone said, should you wear, what hat or helmet do you wear? Um, in the show arena, you really don't wanna wear a hat um, unless it's, you know, a cowboy hat or, or something like that. But um, usually our head, we wanna keep our head free. And then obviously um, helmet, if, if there's a you know a reason that you need to wear that that would be um, acceptable but not uh, something that we require and then um, one question this this individual has asked a couple times where would you stand if the judge is directly behind your goat and someone asked should you tuck your shirt into your jeans yeah um, if your shirt's hanging out you want to tuck your shirt in so that this individual has asked, where do, where do you stand if the judge is directly behind your goat? So that's a great question. If, so if we're looking at this goat here that I've got a couple, it's the same goat uh, that we have on the screen, uh, just taken set up three different ways. Uh, so if you're looking at the very back of B and you're the judge, uh, you just stand off to the side and take, uh, you know, keep a little bit of width between you and the judge. Um, typically a judge is um, going to understand that, uh, especially in a showmanship class. Um, but just making sure you're able to move to the other side of the animal so you're not obstructing. Uh, it's okay to stand off to the side just a little bit uh, to give that judge the, uh, the best view you can, just like if the judge is in the very front of the animal. Um, so if, as we move on to this slide here, uh, in this particular goat that we have set up, when we talk about setting up square, uh, I've seen all kinds of ways people have set up an animal. It should be set up square, true, and natural. Uh, so as we look at, uh, I'm gonna oh, hit the wrong button. Uh, go to the uh, the right hand side first, uh, and looking at the front view of the animal. As we look at A, uh, that person has that animal set up a little bit uh, too close together. As you look at those animals' legs, um, as we know, as we stop animals, sometimes they don't always naturally set up, and you need to move their leg placement. Uh, as we look here, B is set up pretty perfect. Uh, that animal stands naturally. You'll see those legs kind of come straight down from those shoulders, uh, where versus C, that exhibitor has spread those front legs out a little too much and it does look, it looks unnatural. Uh, and it gives that animal the appearance that there's something wrong with her shoulder assembly. Uh, and you don't want to do that for your animals, you want them to look as most natural as possible. As we flip to the back view of the animal here on the left hand side, uh, you'll see the A, um, you'll see those legs, uh, they, they're coming out of that goat just a little bit. Uh, they're set back just a little, um, and you'll see there um, the A, the animal walks tucked in, and there's not as, enough, as much muscle as there needs to be. B, that animal set up pretty square. You want those legs to kind of come straight down, uh, and you see that in C, uh, C there. Uh, they're just a little too far spread out. Uh, before we take more questions, I do want to show this side here. Um, of those of those of a different animal um, but as we look at this uh, here uh, if we look at some of those pictures uh, we can see how those animals are set up and they're pretty square um, and, and some of these that uh, so if we look at a uh, that back animal the front legs are coming down the way they need to be those back legs actually need to be back just a little bit more and on that same thing in a that front goat those legs are a little too far forward Um, oh, go ahead, Courtney. So we've had some questions on how to show a weather dam. Just, I know you mentioned you can brace them, you can't. Um, as a judge, what, what do you primarily see and what would you recommend? So if you're showing a weather dam, you should show them just like you would a market animal. Um, so you're going to want them squared up and... Yep, you um, want them squared up and braced and... Okay. Like Perfect. All right, that's the question Sorry. for now. <laughs> okay, so this picture here, uh, we talk a little bit about spacing in the arena um, and how close should you be to the, and this. I see this a lot, especially in younger 4-Hers who are showing, um, you know, so how far should I be from the person in front of me um, or the per you know, how should we move around the arena? So A is an awful example. You are way too close uh, to the person in front of you. Okay, so B is about right. 
Um, you want to leave a little bit of space between you and that next animal. And then in picture C, we're just too far spread apart. Uh, so my rule of thumb uh, that I always tell a lot of people is that exhibitor, you should be able to be able to move around the uh, goat 360 degrees, uh, even though we're only moving in front of the animal and being able to switch sides. That's when you know that you have enough space. So if the judge happened to go to the back side of the people in A, those exhibitors can't really get to the other side of the animal. In B, they could. In C, they definitely could. Uh, but again, that's just too much space. Um, so that's something to think about as well. Uh, when we move around the arena, how much space that we need uh, for those. Some of the other questions I get asked, uh, there are two different kinds of lineups uh, that we'll ask 4-Hers to go into for a market class or even a breeding class. Um, this one here on, that we have on the picture, this is called a side-by-side -side line. So if a judge is, and most of the time when you're in an arena, you'll have someone that's kind of helping you move around and telling you where to go. Uh, when a judge tells you to go side by side, uh, they're really just going down the line. They're comparing goat to goat. Uh, I think that the computer froze. So um, if you can still hear me, can someone please comment in the chat box? Okay, I'm gonna try to get Robbie back on. But while I do that, um, I want to make sure to also let you know that this will be recorded and um, so if if there's something you want to revisit um, this definitely is going to be recorded as well. Um, also, I will be sharing a um, A video or excuse me a a link for you at at the conclusion in which you can fill out if um, If you are um, needing to check in for your local extension office. Um, also, the other thing, Robbie, if you're there, go ahead and you can share your screen. Um, I think, hang on, there we go. We'll admit him back in. But um, if you need to take the Qualtrics or the survey at the end to let us know you were here, um, we will share that here shortly. I'm pretty sure Robbie, Robbie's planning on finishing up here Again, sorry for the issue, but this is what happens when we have about 300 people on a call and it's, it's a great problem to have. So Robbie, I'll turn it over to you. And um, if you need to share your screen, feel free. Yep, there you go. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, I'm sure Courtney got that covered, but you gotta love technology some days. Um, so I believe where I left off in my Zoom call dropped me was talking about the other kind of lineup, uh, which is called head to tail. Uh, so this is another kind of lineup that we'll have uh, in the show arena. Uh, so you'll see here, uh, we have our first four exhibitors uh, that have plenty of space. Uh, so then we look at that fifth exhibitor. Uh, ideally, that person needs to pull up a little bit because there's a little too much room uh, in, the, in between that animal. Uh, and here's another really good uh, picture of what you should and shouldn't wear in the arena. Uh, we'll notice that most of these people have uh, boots or leather shoes on. Um, we'll have a shirt uh, that they're wearing, whether it's a, a nice t-shirt or a nice uh, button-up shirt uh, that they're wearing and exhibiting. Just a few other tips. Uh, typically, uh, we move around in a clockwise position uh, in the arena. Uh, if a goat is pulled out of line, uh, 
Uh, so say, for example, when the judge is starting to select their class, you know, their class winners and placing them, um, and they pull someone out of line, you should ideally pull your goat up into that where that, where that other goat was. Um, so making sure you continue to move up the line. Uh, and then if you're pulling into a side-by-side, -side, uh, the big thing is you want to stay even with the goats uh, there in front of you. Uh, so making sure the goats of your head are parallel with the other ones and that you're not too far out or too far in. Uh, it just helps the judge better able to see those animals. Uh, so just a few quick uh, wrap up things. Um, again, showmanship's about the growth of where you started in your project and the skills and knowledge that you've gained during that project. So I really like showmanship from that aspect is it really shows how much you've learned as an exhibitor uh, and your chance to, uh, to show that off. Um, big things, uh, just making sure you're practicing with your animal. Um, you know, showmanship does not happen overnight. And it's, it's really something you continue to build on from year to year. Uh, and the more you practice and you put into it, the more you're gonna get out of it. Uh, one of the other things I think is really important, and I mentioned that in the beginning of my presentation, uh, is that showmanship isn't about the quality of the goat, it's about the quality of the show person. Uh, and I think that's something to remember. Um, you don't have to have the most expensive goat or the best goat to win showmanship. You know, it's about how you're able to show that animal uh, and have fun with that project uh, is one of the other important things because it, you need to enjoy it and have a good learning experience. So that uh, is my presentation. Uh, so Courtney, I will take some more questions. Uh, All right. So um, we've had a couple questions kind of about hair. Is it normal for a... Where did that go? Um, is it normal for your yearlings to, sh to start shedding a lot? Yes, absolutely. Um, so goats tend to get a little bit of a winter coat uh, and they'll start shedding a lot. Um, but also just make sure to check that animal and make sure you don't have lice or any of those kinds of things because that happens. Um, I know I had to powder some of our goats the other day. Um, there's hair all over the barn because they are shedding, uh, just losing that winter coat. All right, and then um, we'll take two more. Uh, one question is, do you reward your goat with treats? Um, so sometimes people will use treats to help train their animal. Uh, I don't personally. Um, sometimes if you need them to walk, uh, it may help to get, you know, have a little bit of handful of feed, uh, but definitely something you shouldn't do in the arena. Yeah, and sometimes just with any animal, um, I'm speaking more from the cattle experience, but we would always walk after um, we worked their hair, and then their goal, you know, the, the reward for them was they knew once they got back to the barn that it was time to eat. So they they put two and two together, and they were almost trained to kind of to kind of get a little feisty as they're running back toward, or, you know, going back towards the barn. Um, a couple of, I guess, logistics questions right now, I'm putting in the link for the presentation. Um, it's also on the screen here, so feel free to take a screenshot, jot it down. Um, but again, some counties are asking to see who, who has participated in these events. So feel free to please, um, even if your county hasn't, let us know how you enjoyed this presentation. Um, we definitely appreciate Robert's time today. Um, I know he's a busy guy with a lot of things going on, um, but we were, you know, we're excited to have our weekly sessions here. And next week, um, we are going to be learning about llamas. So we're calling that session Llama Learning. And um, I'm super excited to learn about that. Um, I like llamas. I think they're pretty fascinating myself. So uh, again, we hope you'll join us next week. Uh, in a couple weeks, we'll have a sheep workshop on May the 5th. And then we've got some other really great, exciting topics coming up. So check in with us on Tuesdays at 3. And uh, again, let us, uh, let us know you're here by completing that survey. The link, again, is in the chat box. I'll post it again um, just so that way it's... Uh, it's there as well. So I'll leave my screen up for a couple more, probably about five minutes in case you need to capture the link. If not, if you have the link, you're free to, free to go about your Tuesday afternoon and enjoy the sunshine. And I think it's a great day to work some animals, don't you, Robert?
Oh, I agree. It's very nice outside, and I know that's my plan this afternoon. Yes, so I'm excited to get outside as well. So thank you all. We're, we hope you're safe and well, and um, we hope to see you next week.